I am joined by the beautiful Stephanie, who has a new book. Now, is it out yet or is it about to come out? It's about to come out. It's hatching. <laughs> it is called uh, My Name is Not Anxious. Your name no. is not anxious. Your name. Your name. Your name is not anxious. I was reading it in first person. Uh, so I guess a great place to start would be to just tell us a little bit about it because that title is quite uh, striking. So yes. tell us about it. <laughs> and exactly that same uh, slight confusion I, I made myself several times and in fact there is a chapter in the book called my name is not also not anxious mm. i wanted to find i wanted to find a title i've always been fascinated by titles I, I was a publisher before i became a writer and i've been a writer for a long time and i mm. i i still go to public libraries and you know how books are uh, set in a uh, uh, spine out only yes and i i'm caught by an intriguing title I know it's very very powerful and what I wanted to convey with this title your name is not anxious mm -hmm. was two things really one that anxiety is many things but part of what it is is a story we tell ourselves about who we are mm -hmm. and in order to manage our anxiety I'm sharing myself here too we have to step back just a little bit from that strong identification that it comes from the outside as well as the inside. Mm. I also love the title when I finally landed on it. <laughs> um, your name is not anxious um, because it itself tells a story. And I'm very, very keen on telling stories. I mean, I see myself I mean, I'm hugely well-trained. I've got two doctorates and so on and so on. But yes. I see myself primarily as a creative writer. Right. And, and I think the way of meeting the reader on the page is, of course, to share knowledge, but mm -hmm. also to share story. That's where we find ourselves. Mm -hmm. And did you have that experience reading the book? Yeah, I... I have a lot of questions for you about it uh but yeah i think also what came to mind to me initially is i probably at detriment to myself do say that i am someone who has depression and anxiety kind of out the gate and it is part of my personality i guess in terms of the narrative that i tell myself which in sort of reading i realize i'm should probably stop doing that. I guess I thought by wearing it as a badge, I'm kind of honoring it, but then. But it's not all of who you are, Kimberly. It's no. not all of who you are. It's part of who you are. You have anxiety, you have depression, and anxiety itself is treatable. Mm. You know, we can do so much about it. And that's what inspired me to write this book. Mm. Part of who you are, it's absolutely nothing to be ashamed of. But you are, I'm, I'm looking at you because we're recording this on Zoom. Yeah. You are a complex, interesting, beautiful woman, you know, <laughs> um, and anxiety and depression are part of your story exactly as they are part of my story too. Mm. Yeah, it, it was- I don't mean exactly in the sense of your experiences are the same as mine, but they are also part of my story. And they are part of millions of people's stories. And I do struggle a little bit to, well, I guess I always felt like I was a little fraudulent because I'm like, how on one hand can I be a happy, bubbly, extroverted person and then have this other version of me? And I never really looked at it as a whole. I didn't believe that you could be two things or two things could be true simultaneously. So I kind of lived this, existence of feeling quite fraudulent because I'm like well then does it mean I'm being fake when I'm happy or you know and it it was yeah it's a interesting one to try and include it all as one kind of vessel so I appreciate your your verbiage around the world complex because <laughs> uh, it is also that you are a whole self mm. you are a whole self and that was the starting point for this book each of us is a whole self and you know we we also evolve as we as we age. You know it's one of the mm -hmm. gifts of aging. Uh, from from the beginning we're aging, mm -hmm. and uh, and to embrace our wholeness 
is not something that our superficial society encourages us in. We mm -hmm. have to step back from those uh, very sticky, very superficial labels and really come to a deep acceptance of ourselves as a whole self, because that's the point of reconciliation with what is going well and what is not going so well. And we can draw strengths from what is going well. I mean, it would be tragic if you were to deny the sunny parts of your life, the exuberant parts, the, the risky parts, the foolish parts, the laughing parts, the dancing parts. Yeah, mm. they are you too. Mm. For, for the people who are not yet familiar with kind of your journey, um, and I hope that this comes across in the most delightful and respectful way. It's so refreshing for me to have a conversation with someone who is um, slightly older than I am being so finger on the pulse and forward thinking and encouraging about this subject matter. In my personal experience, it feels like there is not as much of that. And I don't know if you can speak to your peers and your community um, and people who are older than myself, but why is that? And do you think it's just that sort of my generation has been afforded a little bit more time to discover these conversations or was it a sticking point for you? Because to be so well-versed, and again, I, I say this with nothing but respect, but you know, I'm the first person in my family to be having the conversations around depression and anxiety. Yes. You know, my my mum had said, oh, you know, in my day, like, you know, in Nana's day, they didn't have any of that. And I'm like, <laughs> They maybe no. didn't have the words, but I was like, her husband was a, and that with nothing but respect to my mother as well, but was a prisoner of war and gone for five years. Like, I'm yes. sure shit, she was probably depressed. <laughs> like, yes. And, yeah. and long, long ago, long before you were born, and, and probably when I was a child almost, uh, there, was a, there was a very, very famous novel called The Valley of the Dolls, which was all about women's uh, depression, dissociation, boredom. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so on, and the dolls, of course, were all the uh, uppers and downers that they that they took. So mm -hmm. the narrative that this hasn't been spoken about uh, is is quite wrong, actually. Okay. But one Let's... of the points that I make in the in the book is that in earlier generations, people tended to focus more on depression. That you might, for example. Uh, respond to uh, an external situation that causes you a lot of stress by feeling depressed. Now we're much more we're much more subtle and much more um, truthful, I think, in seeing that there are a whole range of things. So a situation outside ourselves, uh, whether it's very personal, like you know, being dumped by somebody with a text message, or you know being made redundant in a job that we really need or or missing out on getting a rental or whatever it is it could be that or it could be the major things that uh, <clears throat> your generation and far too few of mine but all of your generation and younger are so concerned about that we live in a crazy anxious world around <clears throat> excuse me uh, global warming mm -hmm. And, and disparities of wealth and injustice and all those things. So we can perceive and experience an, something outside ourselves that can trigger a range of responses if we're not dead inside. And these can go from panic to profound depression, or they might also include self-harming, they might include body shaming, they might include social anxiety, so we've got a whole spectrum of things to talk about here under this umbrella, which is very vast, mm -hmm. called anxiety. So if somebody just has a bit of a, you know, butterflies in the tummy sort of thing before a big presentation, I wouldn't really call that anxiety. I would call it anxiety when you feel that you can't manage one more thing, you're overstressed, you're overcooked, you're over everything. Uh, when you're awake, often at 3 a.m., when you're endlessly interrogating yourself about your, you know, have I done this well enough? Have I done enough? Am I enough? 
Mm. Yeah, I mean, we both put our hands up. So yes, yes, uh, I, I sort of identify as a little bit of an overachieving perfectionist as well. So I'm quite harsh on myself. I don't know if you relate to that um, also. I write about that quite a lot because it, it not only affects you very, very much because what are you measuring yourself against? Are those your standards or... Is it that you're terribly afraid of what people will think of you if they perceive you've done something not so well, not so brilliantly? Mm. Um, are you requiring yourself to be, you know, startlingly good over a whole range of areas? So those questions are painful for yourself, but they also impose a, a kind of penalty on your relationships because you will often find yourself requiring too much of other people or, or, and this is a biggie, you will hear any criticism as a truth mm. and you will deny to yourself any praise. They didn't really mean it, yeah? So again, I'm going to use that word reconciliation, which I don't actually use a lot in the book but I, I describe these processes very much. We have to be learn to be kind to ourselves, not just kind, generous. Mm. We have to learn somehow to speak to ourselves in an encouraging way rather than committing any kind of violence in our own minds. How are you doing at that? Oh, I'm, look, I'm old. No, I'm doing not. Yes, I'm old. I'm doing very well at it because I've had so much practice and I've thought about these things for so long. However, where I still have a lot of anxiety is around rescuing. Um, have I done enough to help another person in a difficult situation, mm -hmm. particularly if they're very close to me? I mean, in some ways, that impulse was easier to manage because I did my very best when I had a private practice as a psychotherapist and when I worked for all those years as a minister and also did, you know, heaps and heaps of workshops and, you know, mm. work with breast cancer survivors and palliative care and so on and so on. Mm. But when it comes very, very close, when it's family or a beloved person, mm. have I done enough? Have I thought about this deeply enough? Have I worried uh, creatively enough? Mm. Is, is very strong in me, partly because my mother died when I was eight. Mm. And no child can save a mother who's dying in her 30s from cancer. Mm. But somehow or another, the rescuer archetype, and it is an archetype, was lodged in me and I absolutely adored my mother mm. she was my safety and my everything mm. and uh, I think other people's illnesses and uh, um, severe distress I'm not afraid of my own death but I'm very afraid for other people, could I do more, could I do more? So in that area, that's a version of perfectionism. Mm -hmm. And it also goes to, I write in the book about my sort of OCD-ish uh, worries about locking up my house and sometimes locking up my car, but more my house, but especially when my children were young. Am I keeping them safe? Am I keeping them safe? Am I keeping my beloved safe? So these forms of anxiety, I would suggest, never entirely disappear. And, and in their kernel, they're good. We want to keep others safe. Yes, yes. <laughs> we want to be a, a supportive, compassionate, loving. But it's also my work. Mm. So I put a kind of extra burden on myself. Do you see? Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah. um but, but but this burden has also been my liberation, because through the writing of my books, um, 
I have also learned so much, including from your name is not anxious. I have learned so much. Um, I'm curious, just if you don't mind speaking to it, the journey of losing your mother at that age, my mother lost her father at that age, because it does happen often and someone in your community or someone may have a friend or heaven forbid it's happened to them as well. Is there anything that you could advise people <laughs> to speak to that experience that people did well and pe that people didn't do well in that journey for you? because um, I don't speak to too many people who lost a parent at a young age. And I just wonder if it's sort of a bit of a sidebar here, but yeah, just so we all have something in our back pocket. Um, and I know people are very well intentioned, but losing someone, especially a parent, especially a mother, I can only imagine. Um, would you mind sharing with listeners something that people did that was helpful and perhaps with best intentions wasn't? <laughs> um, well, actually, when I was a child, people talked about children's grief almost not at all, mm. or maybe not at all. Um, and I wrote a novel. I've written two novels, and my first novel was called Running Backwards Over Sand. And to some extent, I wrote it out of a kind of rage uh, around people's misunderstanding about children's grief. So, for example, I became... Um, you know, just a little girl, but I became um, kind of really out there, probably a bit rude or a bit, you know, self-assertive. So people would say, oh, Stephanie, she's all right, because I couldn't bear to expose that part of myself to anybody. And I especially couldn't bear people's kind of saccharine, pitying looks, you know, all oh, those girls, they lost their mother. Um, I don't think there's any easy way. Are you thinking about people trying to give support? I, I think the best support I got was from my mother's best friend, who was a quite famous New Zealand potter called Helen Mason. And um, what she did was to keep in touch with me and to, and to just share funny, incidental, um, you know, not 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 too important, not too sad, but just giving me going on as I grew older pictures of my mother, as as she perceived her as an adult woman, which I never had the privilege to do. Beautiful. That was the best thing that happened for me. Not people looking deeply into my eyes and saying blah blah. However, that requires a good friend of the person who is deceased to do that. And it also requires someone with a reasonably high level of emotional intelligence. I think for people who are less sure what to say to a child or to an adult whose parent died when they were a child mm -hmm. is, I can't imagine, but I feel sure that it must have been so hard. Mm -hmm. I think just that acknowledgement. I had another experience many years later, in fact, not, not so long ago, where a woman who was in her 60s was telling me she had just lost her mother. Her mother had just died. And I suppose her mother was well in her 80s, if not 90s. And then she told me this at you know, some length, how distressed she was and so on and so on. And then she turned to me and she said, how old were you when your mother died? And I said, um, eight, in this kind of monotonal voice. And she said, oh, I feel like eight myself. And I felt very insulted by that. It was probably quite true that she felt like eight, but feeling like eight and being eight is not the same thing. Uh, apart from anything else, your frontal lobes. <laughs> And not there at you you can't rationalize anything when you're actually eight. You have to experience everything instinctively and emotionally. And actually, one of the discoveries that I made in writing this book, which is not so prominent in my other books at all, is the kind of physiology 
of anxiety and depression, the, the biochemistry of it, the neurology of it. Mm -hmm. And so understanding where these experiences, these traumas are lodged and, and what kind of memories evoke trauma mm -hmm. rather than positive, what kind of experiences evoke trauma rather than positive memory is something that we all can now understand so much better mm -hmm. than when your mother lost her, was it your mother losing her father? Your, yeah. Uh, so the progress on that has been phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand that in order also to address our own anxiety. How can we calm the body first? Mm -hmm. And I'd love you to dive into that. Uh, I, it, in my journey learning about anxiety, I realize, um, or I believe it, it is a little um, genetics and, and upbringing. I feel like I've carried some of the anxiety that I've witnessed in the household that my mom has had, you know, just because of the way she was brought up and you know without having access to therapy or anything like that just like she swung the pendulum the other way she came from a very unstable obviously living environment so there's a lot of control in my house a lot of needing to know where everyone is at all times and so it's interesting that i've grown up and now i'm realizing in therapy some of these behaviors are because that's how i was raised but it wasn't necessarily my trauma that created that response if that makes sense so Yes, so that, that absolutely makes sense. But also in this present moment, you need to know what, uh, what, what you can do in terms of calming your body when the, when the uh, executive functions, as they're called, the frontal lobe functions, are not working well. So, for example, when you're in panic mode, uh, you're not only feeling uh, flee, fright, flip, freeze, you're also being flooded with cortisol. And there is a great deal you can do about that. You can, you can attend to that by understanding it. You can also calm your parasympathetic nervous system, not only by breathing, but for example, using very cold water, either cold water swimming or, or even putting your face in very icy water if you're really distressed and so on and so on. So, it's, it's very useful to look at the past, mm. but I have come to the view that it's even more useful to look at how am I responding in the present mm. and could I take charge of responses that will serve me better right now? Can I give an example to you and you can treat me for it? Um, I, I've been experiencing... Uh, basically adrenal fatigue and burnout for the last few years. Uh, the perfectionism mixed with the traveling, mixed with the strangulation of my goals because I'm in my masculine energy all the time and not feminine energy. I'm not good at sitting and receiving. Uh, and I think I've avoided relaxing as we know it or self-care because that was that was always be when my depression would come up. You know, a moment of silence would allow that. Yes. So I, I tend to run or burn yes. the handle at both ends. Yep. Less than spiking in anxiety, it feels more kind of like a state um, where I make myself ill and then sort of uh, present in quite physical symptoms. Do you have anything to say to help with that? Because I know that I'm not the only one who's <laughs> doing that. <laughs> I, do. I do have something to say, Kimberly. I, I've just written a book. Yeah, <laughs> your name is not anxious. And yes. it's absolutely jam packed yeah. with strategies for exactly you. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you just said that really struck me was you were afraid to slow down because depression mm -hmm. would arise. Mm -hmm. So if it's not too scary, I would just give yourself some little pauses to say depression may arise. I am visualizing it like a cloud in the sky. It will also move. Maybe it won't move in the next 10 minutes. Maybe it won't move in the next 10 days. But behind the clouds, there is 
infinite spaciousness. Mm. There is infinite spaciousness. So I would do some guided meditation rather than just relying on your own mind. I would definitely do some guided meditation. Mm. And, and I give examples of that rather short, but I've, I've recorded the book as well. So mm. in the audio edition, that I'm able to speak those mm. instructions. Um, but I would also I would also do an audit around what gives you pleasure. I would I would make a little ceremony of what actually gives you pleasure. If, for example, it is, well, you tell me what 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 small sensual thing gives you pleasure? Having my cat sleep on me or yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, on a bigger scale, acting. I love performing. Yeah, brings, no, I'm talking about the small you know. moments. Um, because when we're acting, we're also taking on another identity. I'm wanting to come back to the heart of Kimberly. Uh, I think connecting with uh, being underwater or swimming in, in the ocean is a big one for me, which I don't do enough of. Yes. Uh, but on a smaller scale, yeah, anything with animals, I feel a real spiritual connection with animals. And I feel like that is my safe space. And okay, I just love it. Yeah. Okay, so I would suggest to you that you make a small ceremony around that, both those actions. So, for example, you put swimming daily as as at the top of your agenda, not halfway down that gets put aside when you've got 10 things to do it's the top of your agenda it's the promise to yourself mm. I promise myself I vow I will take the time to be in the water of life mm. yeah I will take my time to be in the water of life and then with your cat or any other animals I would spend some time playing with your cat. If your cat's anything like mine, I've got a marvelous cat called Arlo for Arlo Guthrie. Um, uh, take some time, not just for your cat sitting on you, but for actual play, just that intimate little bit of play, teasing, throwing the ball, laughing, you know, letting yourself be the cat's friend, okay. especially if you have only one cat, do you? Got two. One of yeah. them probably won't play, though. To be honest, she'll just give me shitty side eye. <laughs> okay, well, she can. But the other one, <laughs> she can sit and give you shitty side eye. But I would also, I would also think about, for example, um, extending those, extending those moments of of focus. That's mm. what we're really talking about with meditation. So, if, for example, there's some other thing you could possibly like to do like um really you, you know you live in los angeles you've got amazing art galleries mm -hmm. if you if you decided you would have a 10 week program that you gave yourself of one gallery at a time mm -hmm. and then really reading up on those on those artists doing something that's outside your work zone mm -hmm. but brings you into a greater perspective of how other people see the world. I love visual art for that. Yes. So you, you're, you're not a competitor here. You, mm -hmm. you don't have to prove anything to anyone. Your perfectionism can have a good lie down and a cup of tea. And you just... You know me so well, you've figured me out really quick, haven't you, Stephanie? <laughs> yeah. Well, you could just bring more focus of beauty in that way into your life and then when those 10 weeks are, are finished with come back to me and I'll give you a 10-week poetry <laughs> experience yeah beautiful I love that um I do want people to have your book not only for their enjoyment but as a beautiful resource as well what are you what was your goal in writing it was it for self as as much as it is for for all of us that receive it or what do you hope that people take away from it? Because I see it more as a as a resource, I guess, that I'm sure I'll come back to and read again as if it's a new thing, because that's how my brain works for some reason. That's right. Um, excuse me. 
I, I wrote it because we had a very beloved, we have a very beloved family member who was suffering terribly. Uh, and with all uh, mental health suffering, there's always some element of anxiety. Just as with depression, there's always some element of anxiety and with anxiety, there's always some element of depression and stress worsens all of it. I can't say that strongly enough. Have I said it strongly enough? Stress worsens all of it. And we live in an unsustainably stressful environment wherever we are. The, the environment we live in is unsustainably stressful. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to deal with ourselves individually in a context that is impacting each of us individually and collectively very negatively. And people who suffer uh, extra disadvantage because of race or gender or sexuality or any aspect of identity that's kind of despised by the, you know, so-called mainstream press uh, will suffer even more. I mean, race, for example, is a profound cause of cause of stress and anxiety. So back to my our family member, um, she had two years of terrible suffering, even though as a family we were able to afford, you know, the help that she needed and so on and so on. And I became aware that even for somebody who could access treatment, treatment is inadequate. Um, it's inadequate in part because most psychologists are not making the connections between what is happening physiologically and what is happening psychologically and also what is happening spiritually in terms of does my life have any meaning? Yeah. Okay. So there's that. There's that huge gap that uh, cognitive behavioral therapy does not address. And then there's the even greater gap that many people cannot access treatment because it's out of out of their affordability range. Mm -hmm. And the other crucial factor is that um, we never can have a therapist with us 24 seven. How could we? So many, many years ago when I was a publisher in London, uh, we published a book called In Your Own Hands, which was a really revolutionary book at the time that really emphasized that there is so much knowledge that professionals hold that professionals could share, but don't. And I don't mean that they withhold it deliberately. They withhold it unconsciously, or they don't have it, all this put together. Um, and so I was, I was quite distressed. On top of my distress about her illness, I was quite distressed that some of the treatment didn't touch the sides. Mm. And so I wrote this book for people in a similar or not ne nearly such a drastic situation or maybe even in a worse situation uh, so that they could have the knowledge that they need. But the fascinating thing for me, and the book you know, turned out to be much more of a challenge than I was expecting, I was expecting to write a psychotherapeutic book, but I had to really get up to speed on all the neuroscience and the physiological stuff. And I was immensely, immensely stimulated by that. And I also discovered that the brain loves to be stimulated, which I sort of knew unconsciously, but you know, it's evidence-based. Yes. The brain loves to be stimulated. Uh, and that the resting place of the, of the mind is in and the brain is storytelling. So I made some I made some great discoveries, and I've also I've also reawakened my my belief that when we reawaken our creativity, not you know doing fine art or not just thinking a little bit more originally, a little bit less superficially a little bit more in depth, a little bit more curiosity, 
when we awaken those faculties in ourselves, it also moves us along. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've given loads and loads of actions that might support that with a little heading, try this, because I don't know exactly which one is perfect for this reader, but they do. Mm -hmm. And when they have that, aha, she wrote this for me moment, Done. they will be thrilled. It Good. will come to me through the ether. <laughs> well, totally. Uh, you touched on something that um, I haven't, I well, we've got the physical self, the uh, mental self, and you mentioned the spiritual self as well. That doesn't seem super present in the dialogue that I've been having. It's usually the brain gut yeah. combination or a version of that. And whilst spirituality is kind of everyone else has got their relationship with things. Oh, hold on one second. And as you can come in, that's fine. Uh, yeah, often that's not a piece of the puzzle. And you're saying it's it's really vital and important. What? Because I believe I agree it is too. I just think, why is it missing from the conversation so much? Um, well, I won't even address that so much as why it's missing. I mean, it's missing partly because people often confuse spirituality with religion or with a kind of, you know, very soft edge, new age, and so on and so on. Mm. I'm I'm not talking about that. I'm actually talking about something far more basic to the human consciousness, which is that we seek meaning. Mm. Meaningless life uh, brings despair. And when people are robbed of meaning or robbed of dignity or robbed of hope, this is very dangerous. This is very, very dangerous to the mind. This is where human consciousness is so different from the marvelous instincts of warmth and collectivism and so on that animals have. The human consciousness seeks meaning. And unfortunately, it's often driven towards, you know, bodies of thinking that are, are not healthy, are, are not inspiring, are not um, affirming of the preciousness of human life, of all human life equally, Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, so that is very much part of it. And I wrote one chapter very much inspired by Viktor Frankl, who uh, was a profound uh, psychoanalyst, uh, an Auschwitz survivor who went to the United States after the war and is very well known for a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And he, he not just believed, he researched and knew that if we can hold on to something, a meaningful something larger than ourselves that connects us to our true state, which is one of interbeing, you know, mm -hmm. we affect one another just mm -hmm. by the atmosphere that we generate. Mm -hmm. We need to take responsibility for that. And so I think throughout the book, there is this theme also of learning to be somewhat kinder to ourselves and therefore enabling us to be uh, somewhat kinder within and without the outer world. Mm. That hope is really that word that is stuck with me because if I think back to when I was in quite a severe depression, which was, I was unrecognizable to myself, I didn't have any of that. That was absent. The, even the concept that it could exist yeah. again was really absent. Yes, yes, it is really absent. And in those times, you need other people to hold the hope for you. Mm -hmm. You need to be surrounded by loving, kind people who will hold the hope for you because this too will pass. Mm -hmm. This too will pass. But the person who's experiencing that cannot experience even the memory of when it was better, mm -hmm. never mind the hope that it will be better. So we need to be very conscious, very conscious that in those times, medical help of the best possible kind is needed because until you move on from that, 
you know, all the words in the world won't help you. So you literally need to be held in those times in your, for your safety and for your potential well-being. Because there is a part of yourself that is always well. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, it's just it's, it's and I'm not at all against I, I make it very clear in my book, as Andrew um Solomon does in his book about depression. I make it very clear that there are times in our lives when we absolutely must have have um, medical treatment and drugs if needed and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. I have done all of those things. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's um it's good to to be honest and speak about it, because I do think when people haven't been there themselves, it's a very difficult thing to conceptualize. I mean, I love that people it make me, yeah. So it's it's good to find these words to kind of paint a better picture for people to yes. have empathy for that situation. Because if you haven't lived it, it is harder to speak to it. And um, yeah, the the final question I had, sorry, I could talk to you forever, but I'm very mindful of your time. No, the last question I, I like to ask everyone is what does your brain look like? And I'm just curious if it's a, you're so articulate and you, beautiful words. I just wondered if you could paint us a picture. Mine is like a chaotic woman staring at camera surrounded by filing cabinets that are bulging all the time. Like, so I wonder in your creative exercise tonight, what would, uh, what does your brain look like up there? Oh gosh. When you asked me that question before you gave me your picture, I just thought that the task of a lifetime is integrating the brain, mm. integrating the brain with the whole being, mm. um, really honoring what the brain is trying to do for us and accepting that, you know, sometimes the wires will be very, very crossed. I had a I had a heart thing where it wasn't my heart, it was the electrical systems that went haywire. And sometimes the electrical systems in our brain also go haywire. But we need to regard our brain with awe. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm putting my hands together at my heart like this, and I'm bowing to the miracle of not just the brain, but human consciousness, and that we can, through human consciousness, connect so deeply with each other and with ourselves beautiful what a lovely way to end i feel so honored that i've been able to spend this time with you stephanie thank you so much and thank you for the work and the hours and the re upskilling uh that you've done to create this beautiful resource for people i it's it's been a real honor so thank you so much for your time today well, it's been delightful with you, Kim. Uh, your your listeners can't see how lovely your smile is, and you <laughs> smile a lot. So thank you very, very much. <laughs>